Welcome to another episode of One Town, One Community. Today, I'm joined with by Hillary Cohen and Aaron Millette. Yes. Also. Hello, ladies. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, so, Hillary, why don't you start by introducing yourself uh, for the community? So, my name is Hillary Cohen. I have been in Norfolk for, oh, 27 plus years. I am the animal control officer and a special police officer for Norfolk. Um, I also work for, as a board member of Animal Control Officers Association of Massachusetts. Um, I have been a participating member of Governor Baker's Animal Cruelty Task Force. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> awesome. Oh, great. great. Thank you. Erin? Uh, yep, my name is Erin Millette. I am a Massachusetts licensed wildlife rehabilitator here in Franklin. Um, I am also an assistant animal control officer. Um, I also hold the certificate as a veterinary assistant. And uh, that's pretty much it. Great. Awesome. And Erin, I understand you have a PowerPoint for us before we get into the bulk of my questions. So why don't you go ahead and introduce that and okay. do that. All right. So um, this is our wild neighbors and what we need to know to coexist with them. So we have what exactly is a wildlife rehabilitator? Um, it's a person who has been issued a permit or who has been exempted from the from the permit requirement in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts state law for the purpose of providing care, aid, and treatment to sick, injured, debilitated, or orphan wildlife with the goal of returning, it, returning such wildlife to the wild independent of human aid or sustenance. And there are uh, restrictions. A wildlife rehabilitation permit may not authorize the rehabilitation of endangered or threatened wildlife as provided um, for in, in 321 CMR, venomous snakes, black bear, moose, or white-tailed deer. I can't send you a bear? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't send me a bear. So why do animals need uh, rehabilitation? Um, they could be orphaned, the mother is no longer alive to care for them, or has been separated. They may be injured, hit by a car, captured by another animal, infections, poisoning, etc. Um, and this just goes over rehabbing wildlife with a Massachusetts state permit. So there's two different permits that you can have. You can have a Massachusetts state permit or a federal permit. Um, and the purpose is to provide for the care of sick, injured, debilitated, and orphan wildlife by trained wildlife rehabilitators and to provide Criteria for the issuance of permits to such wildlife rehabilitators. Um, wildlife rehabilitators issued permits pursuant to 321 CMR or persons exempted from the permit requirement may acquire sick, injured, debilitated, or orphan wildlife and provide necessary care and treatment so that the animal may be returned to live in the wild independent of human aid or sustenance. And then the scope of the permit, no person except as authorized under provisions or as exempted, shall rehabilitate wildlife without complying with the provisions of 321 CMR. So there's a few wildlife laws um, that you can look up and what you can and cannot do. And these are what wildlife rehabbers with federal permits can do. A federal permit issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or such other federal agency as may have jurisdiction shall be obtained by the permittee prior to receiving or rehabilitating any wildlife protected by federal law. This shall not preclude emergency care by licensed veterinarians pursuant to 321 CMR, salvage and rehabilitation of raptors by falconers licensed under provision 321 CMR may only be undertaken in accordance with the provisions. Um, the costs, any cost charges or fees, including but not limited to shelter, equipment, labor, veterinarian or other specialist consultation or services, transportation, federal or other licensing fees, and any other expenses associated with the rehabilitation of wildlife shall be the responsibility of the permittee. Donations may be accepted if otherwise permitted by law. And then, um, so, in Massachusetts, it is illegal to relocate wildlife. 
No person shall transport any fish or wildlife species in Massachusetts. And exceptions to transporting and liberating wildlife in Massachusetts include um, permitted Massachusetts wildlife rehabilitators may transport within Massachusetts and liberate rehabilitated wildlife. Permitted Massachusetts problem animal control agent may liberate problem animals at the site of capture or may transport within Massachusetts such animals to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator for the purpose of euthanasia. And let's talk about why relocation is the issue. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm going to take them off into the woods and this is a great spot. There's plenty of food, water, woods, you know, whatever. Well, it's actually um, cruel. So the relocated animal may try to return to its original area and be hit by a vehicle. Squirrels, raccoons, and other wildlife can return from, from 5, 10, or even 15 miles away to get back to where they, you know, live. A relocated animal will have more difficult time finding food, water, and shelter in a new unfamiliar place. If the animal can't find these necessities, it will be stressed and may die. If food, water, and shelter are available in the new site, chances are the site will then already be occupied by other members of the same species and that they will not welcome a newcomer in the territory. They may drive the animal away or even kill it. If the relocated animal is carrying a disease, it may be spread that that disease to other animals in the area. Rabies is a special concern. If the conditions on your property are particularly attractive to the animal and you move it out, other animals may move in to replace it. You may separate a mother from its babies, causing the babies to die. And then, so there's only um, a few birds in Massachusetts that Massachusetts wildlife rehabilitators can can rehab. All other birds need to go to a federal rehabilitator. And those are mute swans, turkeys, European starlings, rock pigeons, rough grouse, ringneck pheasants, house sparrows, and bobwhite quails. And then these are not, most certainly not all the mammals, but these are like the main ones that majority of us take in. Um, Eastern cottontail rabbits, Eastern gray squirrels, red squirrels, flying squirrels, Eastern chipmunks, opossums, raccoons, skunks, and mice. And then let's talk about bunnies, because everybody kidnaps bunnies. <laughs> Put the bunny back. <laughs> Gestation is about 28 days. They breed from February to September. Their diet, their herbivores that they eat, obviously grass, things like that. They nest in shallow depressions in the ground covered with fur, grass, and leaves. Mother feeds twice a day at dawn and dusk. She does not stay near the nest to, uh, to not draw uh, predators. So you won't likely see her. Uh, the babies leave the nest at around three to four weeks. And then let's talk about what to do if you find a nest or your pets bring you a bunny. Nests are hard to see and frequently destroyed when mowing the lawn or farm by pets. If bunnies are the size of an orange or a dollar bill, they are fine on their own. Return them to the, to the area of the nest where they were found. When to seek help. Bunnies are hairless and out of the nest, cold and lethargic, covered in parasites, has been in a cat or a dog's mouth, broken limb, cuts, abrasions, head tilts, bleeding, difficulty breathing, the fur is ripped from the skin or puncture wounds. And then what to do next. If you think the bunnies are orphaned, you can place a tic-tac-toe pattern with string, yarn, dental floss, or flour over the nest. If it is disturbed the next morning, the mother has been to the nest. Keep pets away from the nest. Place a laundry basket, wheelbarrow, lawn chair, or any other object over the nest that will still allow the mother, mother to get to the bunnies. Mother rabbits will not move their nests. So if she's not... She's not going to take the babies and move them to somewhere else. So if there is, the nest is destroyed, you can try to make one like right next to it um, and see if she'll, if she will tend to them in that nest next to it, but she won't move them to another nesting spot. Um, they won't be there long. So just try to be patient. If your dog is getting at them, you know, put them on a leash. Um, they won't be there long. They'll be gone in three weeks. Squirrels. Their gestation is around 45 days. They can breed twice from February to September. So these are kind of really the only um, mammals that we'll see that will have two litters. So we have a early um, spring litter with, with squirrels, and then they have a late summer litter. So we get these guys twice. Um, they're omnivorous, so they eat many different things from plants to nuts to um, some kind of meat sometimes, you know, uh, eggs. Um, they nest in trees. 
They're on their own at about 14 weeks. Uh, infant squirrels can fall from the nest. If uninjured, try to reunite them with their mothers. Mothers will come back and take them, and they will move them to a nest if they're destroyed. Squirrels usually have two nests. So if one gets destroyed, they have one already made that they can bring them to. Uh, place a basket either on the ground or securely in a tree. And then eastern chipmunks, uh, their gestation period is about 31 days. They're born from March through September. They are also omnivorous. They nest in trees. Um, these guys um, are on their own at about 12 weeks. And the chipmunks build nests in deep ground. So if the nest is destroyed by excavation or animal digging, the baby will need to go to rehabilitate. Our chipmunks found outside the nest are likely orphans, but it's also good to wait a couple of hours to see if the mother will return. If possible, place the baby on a heat source hot water bottle. So if these guys, if you find them outside of the nest, you know, they nest in the ground, um, chances are that something has happened, whether they've been taken out by a predator or they've come out looking for mom, um, most likely these guys are orphaned. And then Virginia opossums, North America's only marsupial. Um, their gestation is just 13 days. So when these guys are born, they're actually the size of bumblebees. They're actually born embryotic. So they come right out of the womb and they attach right to the nipple and they continue to stay there. Um, and they nurse continually, continuously. Um, so they are omnivorous, they're nocturnal. Um, they're on their own at about 16 weeks. They nest usually in hollow trees or under buildings. Um, and any opossum baby found that is less than seven inches long from nose to the base of the tail needs to be taken to a rehabilitator. Opossum mothers do not have a strong maternal bond and will not usually return for a lost baby. So if one falls off her back, she's not going back for it. Striped skunks, their gestation is about 63 days. They're born from April to August. They're also omnivorous. They're not, mostly nocturnal, but they may be seen in the early morning or evening. Um, skunks are on their own at about 12 to 14 weeks. Skunks are rabies vector species, so be sure to wear gloves and limit contact. Since mother skunks like to keep their babies with them, skunk babies seen alone are likely orphaned. As with other animals, waiting to see if mother returns is a good strategy. Place the babies in a shallow box or an overturned laundry basket. Raccoons, getting a lot of raccoon calls lately. Their gestation is about 65 days. They're born from March through June. Mother can have one to eight babies in one litter. They are omnivorous. They are nocturnal, but they can, mothers can especially be seen out during the day, especially during um, baby season. They're on their own about 20 to 24 weeks, and the nests are usually in trees, hollow chimneys, Hollows, chimneys, attics, and barns. Um, they also are rabies vector species, so always wear gloves and limit contact. Try to reunite the babies with their mother. Place the babies in a container close to where the nest was originally. Mothers will travel to the same path, so try to place the babies in her path. And remember to keep the babies warm and out of the way of predators. And red fox issues, getting a lot of calls, Hillary, right? A uh, ton of them. <laughs> Red foxes, they're usually uh, susceptible, uh, susceptible to mange. Um, we get a lot of these calls. Um, they can be rehabilitated, um, but sometimes it is nature's way of keeping the species down. Um, it's caused by uh, a, a mite that burrows into the skin. This causes itching, scratching, and increased inflammation. Uh, mange can be transferred to dogs. So, you know, if they're rolling around and where the fox has been, that's a way that they can get it. It is illegal for rehabs to, tra to trap an animal. So unless it's easily catchable, there's not much we can do. So getting back to what I was saying with, you know, people say, oh my God, this is poor fox. It has mange. Help it. If we can't get it on a rabies pole or it's not that lethargic that I can't go up and grab it in a towel, then again, there's nothing we can do for it. If it's, if it's able to run away from me, then it's not that, in that bad of shape. Um, gray foxes rarely get mange, possible, possibly because the mite doesn't live that long on them. And uh, gray foxes can also climb trees where um, red foxes don't. Coyotes can be seen at all hours. This is another common problem that people are calling about, coyotes. 
Um, they are most likely nocturnal, but also hunt at dawn and dusk in places with few hum humans. They will hunt during the day, especially when feeding pups. So they've adapted to, um, although they're like a nocturnal species, they've adapted to humans. They, you know, they have to adapt. So you'll, you'll see them all the time. And they're brazen, so you need to haze them. It's just kind of like a dog, you know, dog gets in the trash, you yell at the dog, get out of the trash. Well, nothing bad happened to the dog when they got in the trash, so they're going to continue to get in the trash. So when you're hazing coyotes, you really need to push them out. You know, they look, oh, human came, he yelled at me, and then he went back in the house. Big deal, like I'm going to leave the yard. Like nothing bad happened. So you really want to keep on them and get them moving. Um, coyotes are usually shy, but if they approach, make a lot of noise and act large to scare them away. Coy attacks on humans are rare. So unless they're sick, you know, rabid or something like that, they're not going to bother you. They're more scared of you than you are of them. Um, they can be creatures of habit. So if you see one at the same time and place while walking your pet, change your route or timing. Um, if you have a small dog and encounter a coyote, pick up your pet. If you notice one or a pair of coyotes following you, they are escorting you or shattering you through their territory, territory to make sure you don't bother their den. So they probably have some pups around and they want you to leave. And then um, this is also a big issue, um, rodenticide poisoning in um, our raptors, not only in our raptors, but in all sorts of wildlife, possums, um, foxes. So when you use rat poison, um, you're not just killing rats because they don't just die right away when they eat it. They eat it, they leave your house, they go outside. The eagle comes down, eats that rat, and now they get rodenticide poisoning. And it's not a nice um, way to go. It, it, um, it kills them slowly, they bleed out, they hemorrhage. Not only wildlife suffers from it, but if your cat, you have an outdoor cat, and it gets one of those, then your cat's going to get the same thing. So just something to think about. I, I know, you know, mice and rats can be a problem for people, but there are other ways to, to get rid of them. Um, wildlife can harbor an array of diseases. Some can be tra transmitted to humans and certainly to pets. Always wear gloves um, and certain diseases, rabies, parvovirus, Bayless ascaris, which is raccoon roundworm. Salmonella, leptospirosis, listeria, Lyme disease, hantavirus, tularemia, and mange. Um, and lead poisoning is also something that we see in a lot of our um, waterfowl. And a lot of the um, bald eagles get it from eating deceased carcasses. So from um, the lead from um, the bullets from deer when they're eating deer carcasses and things like that, a lot of eagles come in with um, lead poisoning. And then nesting birds, a um, ton of these calls too. Newborn baby birds are called hatchlings. Hatchlings are newborn two to three days old and have little to no feathers and eyes are closed. Birds with fluffy down are called nestlings. Nest, nestlings are three to 12 days old and have fluffy down with open eyes, usually open at three to five days. A nest is usually three to seven hatchlings. Fledglings are 13 to 21 days old, learning how to fly and self-feed. They are often found hopping on the ground, mom is watching from a distance. Most common kidnapped animal, fledglings, leave them be. That's what they're learning to fly. They're on, a, on the ground, usually in a bush somewhere, and mom is tending to them down there. Depending on species, um, about the, they're about the size of a walnut in a shell when hatched, the hatchlings. Some can be as small as a shelled cashew. Fledglings leave the nest at about three to four weeks. They are about the size of a standard orange and have lost nearly all of their down, and fledglings do not need to be rescued, like I said. They should be left alone to learn how to fly, and pets should be kept away from them. The parents will come back and get them once they have worked for their food. And then what to do with the bird's nest. If the nest is salvageable and there are any hatchlings, nestlings outside the nest, return them to the nest. If the nest is destroyed, reconstruct nest or replace with a similar structure, replace in location where it it originated and observed from afar to see if mom returns. That sense like, oh, don't touch it. You know, if mom smells you, she won't come back. That's a myth. Remember, fledglings will leave the nest when they're about the size of an orange. Um, and also remember the parents return about every 20 minutes and baby should be left there as long as it isn't dark or cold. 
Baby should not be left overnight if the parents do not come back. Call a wildlife rehabilitator. Items you can use to recreate a nest, plastic bin or other container, felt small knitted hats or other warm cloth, no big loops, or anything that can wrap around their limbs or necks, heating pad set on low or a hot water bottle wrapped in a towel for ambient heat, not direct. Um, no original nesting as it may contain mites. And injured or orphan animals, what to do immediately. Wear gloves, pick the animal up and place it in a container or box with a soft towel or cloth. Note the area where you found it. This could be important for release later. Place in a dark, quiet area, limit contact with others. Add a heat source, a sock filled with rice and heated in the microwave, a hot water bottle, a heating pad on low, and call a wildlife rehabilitator. Absolutely no food or water. First thing everybody wants to do is feed it. No, please don't. Uh, most babies are hypothermic um, and dehydrated and you can't process food when you're cold um, and also when you're dehydrated. So the most important thing is keep them warm. Baby animals cannot thermoregulate, so um, warm. All I can say is warm. Warm, dark, and quiet. No food. And then just some skunk recipes for your dog. Hydrogen uh, peroxide, baking soda, and dish soap. Um, Hillary probably says vinegar. What's your take on skunk dogs skunk I, I actually don't i don't own a dog right now i haven't had well, one in several you, years what <laughs> but yes so white for when i get sprayed i definitely use white vinegar white vinegar works um tomato juice feminine hygiene product um or skunk specific skunk specific shampoo um and you we use skunk off skunk off products work pretty good and then um, turtles, turtles are coming. Um, we often see turtles trying to cross the street. You can, all, you can help them get across safely. Always pick the turtle up from the rear and move to the, side of, move to the side of the road in the direction they were traveling. Don't turn them around and go the other way. They know where they're wanting to go. They want to go um, lay their eggs and then they will return back to where they want to go. So um, with snappers, they can, turn the neck quite a bit, so um, always hold them at the rear. And uh, you can use a um, car mat, you can use a shovel, you know, if you're nervous about picking them up. Um, and then, you know, cracked turtle shells. The turtle is still alive, it's the shell. The shell is like bone and can be mended. Please take any turtles with cracked shells to a wildlife clinic, depending on how bad the, the shell is broken, um, you know, they can, fix those, like I said, the shell is bone, so it's just like a fracture, depending on the damage and where it is. And then uh, saving and transporting an animal. Um, wear gloves, throw a towel over the animal's head to immobilize, scoop the animal up and place in an appropriate size container, place a towel or sheet in the container. An, anim an injured animal should not have a lot of space to move around. If possible, add a heat source. Um, Call a wildlife rehabilitator. If no one is available, you may try your animal control officer. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so after all that wildlife talk, um, I wanted to jump in as animal control and also um, let everybody know that, you know, there is a time when you need to call animal control versus a rehabilitator. Mm -hmm. If there is a uh, interaction with wildlife and a pet physical interaction or wildlife with a human where there is an exposure, a bite, a scratch, um, any kind of salivary type contact that is made, um, you definitely need to contact the uh, animal control officer. Uh, ex excluding for the most part, possums because they are marsupial but they have a lower body temperature so they don't normally harvest rabies but anytime that there is um, physical interaction where there is an exposure with a wild animal you definitely need to call animal control or your police department because we do need to get that animal if possible and have that animal tested for rabies because what people don't understand is uh, rabies is fatal 
to humans. And if you do have an exposure, we need to, one, hopefully be able to isolate that animal so that we can test it. And if we can't, then we need to be able to advise the, the person who was exposed or the person's pet that was exposed to be in contact with their primary care uh, physician to discuss um, the risks involved surrounding that exposure. And if it's an animal, they need to contact their, their pet's veterinarian uh, and discuss the situation with them. Great, awesome. Erin, do you have anything to add with um, when to call animal control? Um, no, I think, I think you're right. Like any, um, you know, especially, you know, these people that take in raccoons and they brought them into play, like, don't do that. Right. You know, like if you get a rabies vector species, you need to wear gloves. You need to not have your whole family play with it. Um, you know, cause like Hillary said, a rabies exposure is a serious concern. Um, yeah. So don't, please don't do that. I mean, you, you, I'm sure have gone to calls where they've passed it around to, you know, the whole family and things like that. And it doesn't help the animal because if we have something like that, the only way for us to test that is to euthanize that animal. So nobody wins in that situation. And we've also had people in Norfolk that, that found, you know, three baby raccoons and thought it would be great to make them as pets. And they eventually destroy the people's house. They do get aggressive. Um, and in that situation, it turns into a, a, a very fluid, layered situation because if they become patterned to humans, it's it's really hard to set them loose again. Correct? Yeah, correct. We yeah. can, we can only you know release wildlife that um, you know can sustain, be sustainable in the wild. And like we say, a fed mammal is a dead mammal. Yes. Very good. So if they're um, looking for people for food, then you know, like for instance, that you know that person that had those raccoons banging at their door looking for food. Right. Exactly. Uh, so one thing when you when you encounter an animal that has been hit by a car or possibly even hit by a train, because we do live in Norfolk and Franklin, um, and and this does happen, and the animal is still alive, don't think that just because that animal looks like it's completely injured and is in, in introverted and not reacting to anything, that if you go and pick that animal up, it's not going to try to defend itself. Absolutely. And that, and that absolutely is probably one of the most common reasons that we do have an exposure is because the animal behavior, um, it, people don't understand wild animal behavior and know how to interpret it. And, you know, they're doing a great deed, but sometimes people do end up with exposures that way. And it doesn't just mean for wildlife, a dog or a cat or any animal that is suffering from any kind of pain or trauma, they can mm -hmm. react very violently, which can, you know, exacerbate the, the outcome of the situation. And anytime you do see, you know, an animal in the roadway, this is what animal control officers are here for. We have, mm -hmm. the, we have the equipment and we have the training to 99% of the time be able to intervene, get these animals off to the care that they need without any further damage to the animal or to society as a whole. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's where, you know, part of animal control offices are, you know, their public safety too. You know, we have lights on our trucks. We don't want people in the middle of the road um, getting hit by cars trying to save a possum either. Correct. You know, like things like that. So, you know, you just have to use common sense, um, you know, when yeah, you're doing things. Yeah, and creativity. As, as Aaron knows, um, we have a family of swans up on Park Street right now that have decided, due to our water table being so high, that bush pond is no longer fun. So multiple times a day, they are crossing over Park Street to go into um, quite a big puddle across the way. But we were ending up with cars stopping, people trying to feed the swans roadside, which will eventually pattern the swans to stay by the road, which we don't want. Um, but we don't want people stopping in the roadway. It, it's dangerous for the people. It's dangerous for the swans. Uh, you know, and sometimes you do have to get really creative. And uh, as I'm sure a lot of people on Park Street in that area know, 
Um, we had a trooper that stopped and, and has put out cones. And now that we have um, the electronic signboard up there in this odd spot, just to let people know there's, there's a swan crossing right there. And, you know, please don't interfere. Don't try to herd them across the street. Don't try to feed them. Just be aware that they could be crossing in that area. And you just have to get creative with different approaches as to how you help wildlife without changing their patterns. Great. Well, that was very informative. I'm sure uh, the community will greatly appreciate that. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to get a little more personal and uh, talk about how both of you got involved in this. What made you want to get involved with animal control and animal rehabilitation? And yeah, what was your uh, <laughs> beginnings, I guess? You want me to go first, Erin, or do you want to go, go ahead? Go ahead. Okay, so as a child, um, I started riding horses when I was eight years old. And so I've always had an affinity for animals. Um, you know, I grew up in a house with a, a dog and a cat in uh, Darien, Connecticut. And I started riding at eight and I was hooked. Uh, unfortunately, for the piggy bank of my parents, because horses are not cheap. Um, and I rode all through uh, school growing up. And then I went to a boarding school down south that specialized in, in horses. And then I went to college for an equine science degree, an equine business management degree. And right out of college is when I landed in Norfolk. And it was to teach and train horses over at the Wearlands. Um, I did take that business over eventually. But during that time, um, there was a job posting for uh, the dog catcher back then. Um, so I just put in a resume because why not? You know, I, nobody knew what the job entailed. And even after I was hired at that time, nobody knew what the job entailed. <laughs> there was very little training back then. Um, I, I'm in my, well, late 24th or early 25th year of uh, working for Norfolk as the animal control officer. And I love it. I love that each and every day is totally diverse and it's always fluid. It's usually never the same day twice. Um, because I'm a special police officer, I do have more roles than um, just my ACO title. And um, so it does, it, it has a lot of law enforcement involved and enmeshed in it as well. And as some people do know, um, we prosecute our cruelty and neglect in-house and knock on wood. We have a very high success rate. Um, so, you know, being a special, you know, I did go to the police academy down in Foxborough, uh, South Suburban Police Institute. And it's been such an asset to um, help my animal control position because I can take the call from the initiation and bring it all the way through prosecution. Um, and that's been probably why we've been so successful. And Norfolk and like Millis, Medway, Foxborough, Franklin, there's so many towns that are so proactive for animals right now. And our court system has been uh, very much open arms dealing with animal cruelty and animal neglect. Um, but again, our, the job is never the same, same thing on the same day, usually. I mean, just six weeks ago, we had Millis and Foxborough Animal Control come into Norfolk, and uh, I had to apply uh, for two search warrants, which were granted. And those those two ACOs were fantastic, helping me execute the search warrant. And we we were able to get four beautiful animals into care. And you know, also in that same week, we also had a, an animal that needed to be removed from a hoarding situation. It's it's always fluid. You don't know what's coming on our phone until you actually pick up the phone and find out what's next. What's your next call? Um, just like today, I had a resident in, in Norfolk uh, call about two uh, squirrels of concern. And with the relationship with Aaron, I was able to get the, the resident patched through to Aaron so Aaron could talk to the homeowner and get the, the appropriate help for the animals. 
Um, but it really is, you, you never know what the day is going to entail and it's never boring. It, a lot of times it's, it's excruciating and it's hard and it's sad, but when you know that you are the voice for the animals and being able to protect them, it, it's so worth it. It is so worth it. And as I've always said in animal control, our, the motto in our town at least is we help people with animal problems and we help animals with people problems. Great, great. Thank you. What about you, Erin? Uh, I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I always had a huge love for animals. And I can remember in camp, I got the Animal Lover Award. Um, <laughs> but I think um, I always, I, I actually wanted to be a marine biologist um, throughout my whole entire life. And then I think as I graduated, I just kind of lost my life took a different path and kind of got lost at where I wanted to go. And um, I guess um, I had gotten really sick and almost kind of near death experience. And then that brought me to the point of like, what am I doing? I need to really do what I want to do in life. And then um, I had became a certified dog trainer. And then I saw the posting for the assistant animal control officer. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I could do this. Well, let me try and see what happens anyways. So I did get that job. And um, what brought me to be a wildlife rehabilitator was as doing that job, I saw like, I would probably say that 70% of my calls are wildlife and 30% are actually domestic. That's just, I mean, me, I don't obviously work full time like Hillary does, but um, I would say in my opinion, that's what I deal with. And I came to realize that, um, you know, it's people, majority of these problems with these wildlife is people. So what can I do to make a difference, um, to educate in the community, to help these animals? Um, so I set out to get my um, license four years ago, and that's what I did. Um, and then I said, oh, I wanna get some more knowledge. So then I went on to Massasoit and got my certificate in veterinary assistant. Um, and then I've taken also many other classes, um, you know, for animal control, just other things like that. I just did a recent um, large animal rescue training. So I'm always looking to um, expand my knowledge and all sorts of animal stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much it. Great. Awesome. So, uh, Hillary, I know we can, uh, we can see your cat there behind you. Uh, do you have any other pets besides your cat there? So she is normally super elusive. If anybody knocks on my door, she is hiding under the bed. But I am sitting on her chair right now. So she is not going to leave until I, she's not going to sit down until I leave. But she definitely owns this chair. Um, her name is Money Penny. And she does have a full brother named James Bond. Um, and I have a miniature horse named Bridget, which apparently I am bequeathing to Aaron if I ever <laughs> um, decide that I can no longer care for my, my little mini horse because she adores her. And I also have a um, what's called a Paint Shire Cross. It's a horse. He's all different colors, and he's almost as big as a Clydesdale. I, they are my glorified pets and my lawnmowers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they have not learned how to, how to mow in a straight line ever yet. <laughs> awesome. Great. Erin, what about you? I have six. I have four cats and two dogs. Um, Mittens, Maggie, Milo, and Carrie. Those are my cats. And then I have Harley and Otis, an Australian Shepherd lab mix, and a Min Pin Pitbull mix. So she's quite the looker, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Do you guys have any um, favorite types of animals? I like seals. Seals, I would say, are my favorite animals. I've always loved seals. And Hillary, what about you? I am a horse person, tried and true. Um, but I, I love all animals. I, I'm super fond of cats and uh, you know basically any animal. Um, but if 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 I had to pick one, it would definitely be horses. 
Awesome. Great. What, what about Norfolk? Do you guys have any favorite places in Norfolk? I like the anywhere that is woodsy trail like uh, where I can just be with nature up by Bush Pond or down on North Street at the little park across from like around 50 North Street. Um, Stony Brook is pretty. Uh, it's hard for me to actually go out and enjoy Norfolk. Um, a lot of times I would go to a different town because everywhere I go in Norfolk, somebody has questions for me about their dog or their cat or something that they saw or a problem with their neighbor. And it, and it does sometimes detract from just kind of a decompression and enjoying time with nature. So a lot of times I, I go to a different town or find a isolated area or I just stay on the farm and, and do some gardening and stuff like that. Great, awesome. I like Bush Pond in Norfolk. I frequent there every day. Um, I like to watch the swans. So I watch that mother swan sit on her nest every day. Um, and now that she has her babies, I go check on them um, daily. But I like just to sit there and see, you know, what's going on over there. Like there was a hawk that was flying. So it's just nice to just sit there and just, you never know what you're going to see over there. Great. Awesome. Um, so moving on to kind of the topic at hand that everybody that's on everybody's mind. Um, how has, how has the animal control and a rehabilitation kind of industry or business been affected by the COVID-19, the current pandemic that we're all dealing with? So Aaron, do you want me to talk about animal control? Yeah. And do it? Okay. Sure. So um, Aaron works with uh, Millis and Medway ACO, Brenda Hamlin. Uh, she is the lead ACO uh, for Millis and Medway. When we learned about COVID, Brenda actually took the helm and we, we knew that it was so uncertain whether animals would be carrying or contracting COVID. And, you know, we've learned differently throughout all of this time that certain animals with different cell structures are more susceptible. Some can carry, some can contract. Um, but what Brenda did, which was really amazing, she took it upon herself to find a facility that had closed down during COVID and make it and ask them to um, allow us to use it as a decontamination station for the animals, which was absolutely um, brand new pioneering. I mean, it, the only other one we know about is in New Bedford, specific for animals. So Brenda took that initiative and Norfolk, um, myself, um, actually, supplied all the uh, coronavirus disinfectant that we can use on surfaces, animals, uh, PPE, all the way from booties to gowns to, to gloves to uh, masks. Aaron had donated a bunch of eyewear, which was fantastic. Um, so we've got, you know, a decontamination station available to us if we do need it. I will say the shelter life is definitely different because we do have to uh, maintain social distancing. So if I have an animal that I need to bring into the shelter, um, I make sure that absolutely nobody else, no other human is there. Um, and the same thing if I'm there, if Brenda needs to bring something in, I will, I will leave. Same thing if Erin needs to get in there, out I go. Um, and it's a lot of, of cleaning, disinfecting, sanitizing. Um, I'm pretty sure my hands will never feel moisturized again with the amount of <laughs> <laughs> sanitizer we're going through. I work in a building that is a public safety building that, that has an increased risk for having corona contact. Um, so we have in, in our building, we do wear masks. Even if we're in our own offices, we wear masks all day long. Um, anytime we exit our cruisers in Norfolk for a call, we must be masked. Um, and of course, it's changed the face of how we do door-to-door -door contacts. Um, if I go up to a property, 
I will either call the reporter on the phone and let them know I'm there, or I will knock and I will step back a good 10, 15 feet and maintain social distancing. Um, anything that has to do with, with humans right now, it's definitely different. I will say that there was an, an alert put out that um, bats are not being rehabbed right now, correct? Right, and Aaron? Yeah, they asked us not to because there is, um, I believe I'd have to look at it again, but the belief that humans can transmit it to bats, we're not right. sure. It's still obviously a study, but, and we didn't want them to get the virus. They're still Correct. looking at that. So, and, and any time that we are out and about, we are in masks. Um, I have been able to mitigate a lot. Well, I wouldn't say a lot, probably 50% of my contacts over the phone or through social media or through Zoom, which has been great. Um, but when we do have to go face to face, it's, it's definitely, it's a different time and situation as an animal control officer, people know why we're wearing masks. Dogs don't. And they look at us very, very differently. Um, what might not be a fearful or aggressive dog might think that, you know, we're a stormtrooper when we have our mask on and we have our gloves and we have our glasses on. And, and it can be highly unpredictable. So it's something that um, every response that we go on, we're always thinking of what can happen. And if this happens, how do I protect myself so that nobody gets hurt? So it, there's a lot of thinking process when we respond to calls. Did I miss anything, Erin? What else did I miss? No, I think you got it. I think you got it. All right. Awesome. Great. Yeah, that's that's definitely very informative. Definitely a lot of things that I certainly didn't know. And I mean, I would look at my dog. Well, I never look at my dog with my mask on, but <laughs> or she would think I was crazy because yeah. she I'm crazy regardless. So who knows? So what are you guys doing anything um, either at the shelter or the just as um, in the animal control organization, are you doing anything um, more than what you normally do to try and help and support the community during this difficult time? So Norfolk and I know a couple other towns that have uh, implemented this, but when we have people in Norfolk that are immune compromised, elderly, um, unemployed or financial hardship or whatever is going on that they cannot go and, and financially or physically go buy dog food or cat food. Uh, we will, we will donate that, that food for those people. If they, if they request it, we will certainly uh, pack it up in our cruiser and drop it in their driveway, honk the horn or leave them a message on Facebook saying it's, it's outside, it's in your garage. Um, we don't want any animal to go hungry. And we certainly don't want people to feel bashful and not call us. We're not judging anybody about the fact that there's a financial hardship and they may not be able to have, or maybe they don't even have food in their house at that point. We're here to help. We're not here to judge. We want to make sure that you can keep that animal in your home where it's safest and that it, we would rather uh, we know how important your animal is to you in your family unit. We don't want to take animals into a shelter that don't need to be brought into a shelter. So any way that we can assist, we certainly will. And I did have, you know, I say it's dog and cat food, but, you know, two weeks ago, somebody called me saying, I have no way of going and getting a bale of hay for my goats. All right, I'm going to go get a bale of hay and I will bring it to you. So. Anything that people need, we are really trying to, to get them the resources that they need. And it's also affected some vets aren't doing the same examinations or, or surgeries and stuff like that. And, you know, I had a call yesterday about a lady who thought her rooster's leg was broken and um, her vet was not open. And uh, so I was able to put her in contact with two of the best chicken experts I know and also two vets that I knew that were open that do uh, that are species specific to chickens um so you know people call and say I have a ridiculous question it's usually not ridiculous and 
you know, whatever the concerns are, just give us a call. We, if I know the answer, we'll definitely help you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll work to find the answer and get it to you. Great, awesome. That's, that's really nice and really wonderful. I'm sure a lot of people really appreciate that. And I'm sure a lot of pets and animals appreciate what you're doing too. Yeah, and uh, you know, I gotta say that the, the community of Norfolk, the town as a whole, has been so receptive in making those dog food and cat food donations. I see people walking in from my office window into the vestibule of the fire station, maybe once, maybe multiple times a day, dropping off dog food and cat food. And they have been wonderful to do that because now I have a great pile of food to donate to the rest of the community. Awesome, that's great, that's wonderful. So is there anything else uh, that we didn't cover that either of you would like uh, the community to know or just any last words that you would like to say? So Erin, do you have any impacts with COVID and? Um, they have, so we have some, you know, depending on how comfortable some of the wildlife rehabilitators are with dealing with the public. Um, we have asked um, some people, they can, um, you know, with their dropping it off at your doorstep, we've, you know, we've left um, our own containers, you know, they can leave the animal, we can leave a container out, they can take the animal and put it into one of our containers so that there is no contact um, absolutely with us and, you know, the animal. So the same thing that we're kind of doing is disinfecting um, so that, and they can put the animal and take their container back so that we're not touching the same the same items. Um, some people aren't comfortable with dealing with people at all, so they're just not doing it. But I haven't seen, you know, a lot of the rehabbers seem to be, you know, out there for the animals. So it doesn't seem to be having a huge impact. But just obviously, um, some of the bigger wildlife centers are closed or not taking animals. Um, so that's a bit of a, um, you know, we're relying more on the the local rehabbers, you know, in home to take a lot of the um, animals. So that's been kind of tough on us here, but, um, you know, everybody seems to be doing their part. Good. That's great. Awesome. Anything else before we wrap up? Oh, I have, yeah. thing. I have yeah. one quick thing, yeah. Hillary. Um, did you want to touch when you had said about calling your animal control officers? What are some of the signs of when they should call? Yep, yep. So if you have concerns about a sick or injured animal, but what we're going to talk most specifically about sick. Um, so if you have a animal that you see in your backyard um, that doesn't look right, there are there are definitely signs that you want to call the animal control officer because again, a lot of these wildlife can contract rabies. They can, they can contract distemper, uh, a multitude of things. But as far as the purview for animal control goes, um, unless that animal, if it's just sickness, that doesn't look like rabies. We can only intervene if one, it's critically sick or injured. And in many situations, uh, we actually have to get permission from Mass Wildlife um, before we we interact with those animals. But when it's a situation where you think it's rabies, which is a neurological um, uh, disease process, you're going to see a multitude of different signs in that animal. Um, it, I will say that raccoon, skunks, those are my two hot animals this year for um, what look to be rabies. Um, I know foxes are also sometimes high on the chain. When, if you were to actually come across an animal that, that looks sick and it's neurological symptoms that may be consistent with rabies, um, you're gonna see lethargy, ataxia, uh, sometimes paralysis. A lot of people say, oh, I think it's rabid because it's foaming at the mouth. Um, you know, again, that's species specific kind of. I mean, I don't see a lot of rabid animals foaming at the mouth. I, I think that was derived that. mostly a lot from Old Yeller. Um, yeah. You know, and I can tell you if my if my horse eats purple clover out in the paddock, it's <laughs> going to be foaming at the mouth. So, <laughs> um, but you know, again, 
anything that looks out of the norm, if they're, if they're falling down, if they're staggering, if they are um, totally introverted and curled up in a ball and, you know, not, you know, doing any interaction with the environment, that's not a good sign. And you also have like, that would be like the dumb rabies where they, where they literally are just completely out of it. And you look at this animal and you go, what is wrong? And then you have what, you know, would be labeled as furious rabies, um, which is the ones that are actively aggressive, you know, chewing on car tires or uh, chasing people or balls or other animals or, or um, inanimate objects just, you know, needlessly attacking that object. That that's when you uh, definitely should call us because we want to curb any transmission of that rabid animal. And what people don't understand about rabies is if an animal is is carrying the rabies virus, um, they only transmit it the last uh, ten days of their natural life because that that rabies actually will will take that animal's life at the end cycle. Um, so just seeing an, an, an animal out there, it's not a, not a sign of rabies. And as Erin mentioned, we have fox moms coming out right now. We have raccoon moms coming out right now. So you definitely need to see symptoms of neurological impairment um, and, and always, always call animal control. Great. Awesome. Aaron, do you have anything to add? Uh, just one more quick thing. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that will call and say, there's a fox in my yard with babies. I need to call animal control and have them come remove it. <laughs> Again, touching on what I said in my PowerPoint, it is illegal to relocate wildlife in Massachusetts. So the only way that you can get somebody to come out and take that out is if you call a pack agent. Um, and it's not going to be the result that you want if you do that. So again, animal control offices can only remove sick or injured animals, not healthy wildlife. So right. don't call your ACO for that because we're not coming out. <laughs> and a pack agent is licensed through the uh, mass wildlife through the state. And they go through a training course and basically they are independent trappers. They have their own company. Um, and they do come in, it's very much like a um, pest removal service. And uh, they do charge a fee. Um, but again, I always tell people if, if there's no public safety issue with foxes and other animals that are, that are under your shed or under your deck, give it time, let the babies grow up. They will move along at some point, but the big thing is after they have moved along, you need to repair your property so that it's uninhabitable for another animal to come in and make a new home. Otherwise, you're going to feel like you are the the bed and breakfast and super highway for wildlife. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you both for taking time out of your day to talk to me. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the information, everything. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, Amelia. We enjoyed it. Yeah.